invite you to take your Bible now, or if you have access to a copy of the scriptures, would you join me in the New Testament book of Hebrews? We're continuing our series in this book that teaches us how to find stability in an unstable world, how to have an anchor in the midst of the storm. And uh, we are looking at chapters three and four this morning. We won't read all of both of these chapters. We'll read a section uh, from chapter three and a section uh, from chapter four. And so chapter three, verses one to six, and then chapter four, verses one uh, to 13. Those will be our sermon text uh, for this morning. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest <clears throat> still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoke of a seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterwards in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fail by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-word sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your word. Uh, we come trusting that you speak to us in and through it. Uh, we also admit that as we read passages like this, we can become confused. There's, there's a lot here that we don't understand, and, and we also wonder what relevance it has to our lives. And, and so I ask for your help this morning. Would you help us to humble ourselves? Would you help us to have the faithful expectation that your spirit will accompany the reading and teaching of the scriptures? Would you give us understanding, and would you open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, uh, so that we can receive your voice this morning and be changed by it. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I've mentioned Max Richter to you before. Uh, he's a composer. He's written music for films like Arrival. And a few years ago, he wrote an eight-hour piece of music titled Sleep. And for at least one live performance of that piece of music in Austin, Texas, they brought beds into the concert space, and naps were encouraged during the performance. And Max Richter calls this piece his lullaby for a frenetic world. He calls it his manifesto for a slower pace of existence. Doesn't that sound nice? Doesn't that sound nice this morning? 
One of my assumptions as I come to this room week in and week out is that many, if not most of us, come into this room exhausted. And exhausted in ways that are more than physical. We come to this room in need of a lullaby. We come to this room with a deep need for rest. And we find that, not just in the music of Max Richter, but in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. The word rest is repeated over 10 times in these two chapters. We find in these words a lullaby that sings to us of the profoundest rest imaginable. Sings to us in a way that calls us out of our deep exhaustion into something more, into something better. But the problem with that is that as we listen to this lullaby in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, it doesn't sound like what a lullaby is supposed to sound like. We don't find here the calming music of Max Richter. No, we find the dissonant sounds that warn us of God's wrath, that give us the violent and disturbing image of God's word as a two-edged sword that divides bone from marrow. And so this morning, I think we need to come to this passage and we need to ask a few questions about rest. We need to ask a few questions of this lullaby. We'll ask two this morning. What is the rest offered here? And then how can we have it? So first of all, what is the rest offered in this lullaby that we find in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4? And unsurprisingly, if you've been paying attention for the past couple of weeks, the book of Hebrews uses a psalm from the Old Testament to address its theme. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 quote extensively from Psalm 95, a psalm that we considered together last week. And part of what Psalm 90, or last month, and part of what Psalm 95 does is it remembers the failures of God's people in the wilderness. It remembers how God's people had failed to trust him and his servant Moses. But it speaks of that failure in a unique way. It says because of their failure to trust God and his servant Moses, they did not enter what? Rest. Now the stories in the book of Numbers show us that they did not enter a land. The land that God had promised to them. So why does the poetic retelling of the story in Psalm 95 say that they didn't enter rest? Well, notice it doesn't say they didn't enter their rest. It says they didn't enter my rest. Whose? Who's talking? God. They didn't enter God's rest. But what does that mean? Well, Hebrews 4, chapters 3 and 4, connect the rest of Psalm 95 to the Sabbath, to God resting on the seventh day of creation, not because he was tired, but because he was happy, because he was satisfied, because he was enjoying the goodness of what he had made. And then God shares that happiness with his people, as in the law, he creates a pattern of Sabbath a weekly pattern of the Sabbath day, and then a larger yearly pattern with the Jubilee years. It's important to realize that that the Sabbath is not about restriction. It is about participation. It is the invitation for God's people to share in his own happiness, to share in his satisfaction, to share in his enjoyment. The focus isn't on what you can't do. 
No, the idea is that you cease from what you are doing so that you can celebrate and enjoy what God has done. That's what the Sabbath is about. But what does that have to do with the land? Still, why does it say they did not enter God's rest? Well, certainly the land was the place where they were to enact this pattern of Sabbath, including giving the land itself rest. But there's more. What the Sabbath was to time, the land was to place. Here's what I mean. The Sabbath, the practices of the Sabbath, were for the purpose of connecting the people to the God who rests and gives rest. The land was for that same purpose. What was at the center of the land? The city of Jerusalem. What was at the center of the city of Jerusalem? The temple. The place of God's presence, the place that is called over and over again in the Old Testament in passages like Psalm 132, the resting place of God. And so like the Sabbath practices, the sacrificial practices at the temple were for the purpose of connecting the people to the presence of the God who rests and gives rest. That's why it says they failed to enter God's rest. But what does that have to do with us? And what does that have to do with our need for rest? Well, the Sabbath pattern and the sacrificial practices show us that rest at its heart is relational. We know this at a human level. There are people in whose presence we naturally relax. And the promise and the possibility of rest is entering at a much higher level that kind of relationship with God, that kind of connection to his presence. It's similar to our ideal of home. What's our ideal of home? It's not just a structure, it's not just traditions, it is a structure and it is traditions that enable relationships. Relationships where we belong, but don't have to constantly prove that we belong. The ideal of home is relationships where we are fully known in all of our mess, but also fully loved and accepted. The deepest rest is finding that kind of home with God. It is entering that kind of relationship with him and his presence. And I want you to see how this vision of rest addresses the deepest cause of our exhaustion. Why are we so exhausted? Why are we so tired? It's not just a lack of physical sleep. It's not just an overfull calendar. Those are important issues that need addressed sometimes. But the deepest cause of our exhaustion is what someone has called the eternal inner murmur of self-reproach. It's that constant voice within us that says, not enough. You haven't done enough. You aren't good enough. You don't have enough. You aren't enough. We are so tired because we live day in, day out, hour in, hour out, minute in, minute out, trying to shout down that voice within us. And being at home with God, the full possibility of Sabbath is that voice silenced by the enoughness of the God who is our maker, 
and who is the Father who loves us with a love beyond all understanding. That's what rest is. But second question, how do we have that? How do we hear that enoughness? How do we enter into God's rest? How do we find that home with him? Well, the first step is to realize where we are. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 looks back to the wilderness stories of God's people, not just to remember what happened, but to talk about what is happening. In these chapters and throughout the New Testament, that past is applied to our present. Hebrews imagines it sees the Christian life, the life of the church, as a life in the wilderness, as a vulnerable pilgrimage to that divine, eternal joy. Which means we're not there yet. We're still on the road. We're still in the desert. And so chapter 4, verse 1, the promise of rest, it still stands. It's still out there in the future. Chapter 4, verse 8, even after Joshua brought the people of God, the second generation, into that land that was supposed to be God's rest, Psalm 95 still says today, The promise of a Sabbath rest remains a future possibility for the people of God. And that sets two expectations for us. The first expectation is that we will not experience the fullness of rest for now. Which means that there will be seasons of exhaustion. Seasons of deep weariness as those who walk this road towards God's eternal joy. And then the second expectation is that those seasons of exhaustion will make us want to quit. That weariness will tempt us to leave the road, to abandon the journey as that first generation did in the wilderness. And so understanding where we are then prompts us to ask, well, how do we stay? How do we stay on the road? How do we survive this spiritual desert that is an an inevitable part of our experience as Christians individually and as a church? Well, the people who survive this spiritual wilderness are not those people who go on that television show alone, And they know how to forage food and build the perfect shelter and endure harsh conditions. No, survival in this wilderness is not the result of survival skills. It's the result of listening skills. Why didn't that first generation make it? Chapter 4, verse 2. Well, they heard the good news like we have, but it didn't benefit them because they were not joined in faith to those who listened. They were not sustained by the word of God that had come to them through Moses, who's mentioned at the beginning of chapter three. They were not sustained by that, by that word that said that God was with them, that he would sustain them, and that he would assuredly give them the land that he had promised to them. And so because they were not sustained by that word, when they came to the land and sent the spies into the land and the spies returned, they did not join with the faith of Joshua and Caleb who had listened, who had heard that word and who said, because God has promised this to us, let's go and take it. And instead, they joined themselves with the faithlessness of the other 10 spies who said, this is too much for us. We should never have come here. We should never have left Egypt in the first place. And if we are gonna survive the desert, we have to realize that God has given us a better word. 
He has given us a word, not through his servant Moses, the servant of the house of God, but he has given us the word of his son, of Jesus, of the one who is, who is the son over the house of God and makes that house for us a home. How does the book of Hebrews begin? It says that God has spoken in fragments in the past through people like Moses, but now he has spoken fully and finally and definitively through his son, Jesus, who is the radiance of his glory. Jesus is that voice from Psalm 95 that says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Jesus is the word of God from chapter four that is sharper than a two-edged sword that divides bone from marrow. And understand that that blade, the blade of the gospel, the blade of the message about Jesus talked about in chapter four, it is not the sword of a soldier, it is the knife of a priest. That's the actions described in verses 12 and 13. When it talks about being exposed, it's the language that describes the exposure of an animal's neck as that animal is prepared to be made a sacrifice. That is a disturbing, frightening image. But understand and remember what was the purpose of the sacrifices. Well, like the practices of the Sabbath, the purpose of the sacrifices was to connect the people to the presence of God who rests and gives rest. And so the blade of the gospel exposes the deceitfulness of sin. It exposes our unbelieving hearts, mentioned in chapter 3. But that's not the end. That's not the goal. It exposes sin and our unbelieving hearts so that it can connect us to the healing, sustaining presence and promises of God given to us in Jesus. It exposes all of the false ways that we try and seek rest by what we do so that it can bring us and lead us and sustain us towards the rest that results from what he has done. And so as Christians, we're like camels. How do camels survive the long, hot road through the desert? Well, they drink a surplus amount of water that will keep them on that journey. As believers in Jesus, as those who are on the desert road, we must drink deeply of the water of the gospel, the water of God's Son, so that he can sustain us on this hot, long road towards God's eternal rest. There was an article in the Atlantic recently, and it was written by an undergraduate at Yale. And this undergraduate writes about the torturous anxiety of always trying to be an overachiever of always trying to gain and maintain the status and success that are expected at a school like that, of dealing with the constant voice that says, oh my God, maybe I'm a loser. And commenting on this problem, a writer named Freddie DeBoer writes this. He says, sometimes I think the great American rite of passage is when you go from a youth full of Ritalin to an adulthood full of Xanax. All that yoga and relaxation tea and time spent grinding on a meditation app, it looks transparently like an aftershock from a culture that makes aspiration itself that which is most aspired to. A class of strivers striving to strive, clawing up the hill of achievement with bloody elbows. It ain't healthy. Maybe it's time to kill the thing off at the root. That's right, it ain't healthy, but it's how many of us live. And it is the blade of the gospel that will kill it off at the root.
Will you let it? Will you open yourself? Will you make yourself vulnerable to the blade of who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he says about you? Will you let him teach you a better way of striving? Striving to enter God's rest by listening deeply to what he has done for you. Will you let your bloody elbows from trying to climb that hill of achievement be healed by his bloody body? that ascended the hill of Golgotha for you? Will you listen to the lullaby? Will you let that voice that says never enough, that says maybe I'm a loser, be hushed by the lullaby of Jesus saying from the cross, it is finished. Let's pray. Father, we are an exhausted people. And we're not only exhausted by our unhealthy patterns and our overly busy lifestyle, we are exhausted by that constant sense that we haven't done enough, that we we don't have enough, that we aren't enough that constant tr- striving to, to prove our status, to prove our success. And Father, I pray that you're, this morning you would call us out of that. That you would help us to drink deeply from the water of life that is ours in Jesus. That you would help us to listen deeply to the music of what he has done for us. So that even in our exhaustion, we will be sustained on this road to your eternal rest. Help us not to harden our hearts this morning, but to make ourselves vulnerable to the work and presence of your Son who is making us your home and who will lead us to that full and final home. We pray it all in his name. Amen.